Sure. Happy to sit down with anybody at any time and talk about it. I will commend you to the written testimony, which has nice color charts and some graphs. We sort of go into a lot of the details and more, more specificity, but happy to sort of set up an appointment with you, Assembly Member. Thanks. Please. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Thank Alano. you for being here. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Chris Gokin, Director of Public Policy from the New York League of Concert Vote, Conservation Voters. And following Mr. Gokin, we have Parks and Trails New York. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, staying here so late today. Uh, I will be very brief. You do have my comments written, uh, but I'll just draw attention to a couple of main points. So first off, my name is Christopher Gokin. I'm the Director of Public Policy with the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, I want to thank you all for advocating in the past several years for increases to the EPF and also for environmental funding generally. I don't think we would be at the point where we are today talking about this $300 million EPF if it wasn't for the hard work and advocacy that uh, many of you have done over the past several years. So thank you for that. I'm going to join the chorus, the cheerleaders for the $300 million EPF. You've been told all day how great it is for the state. I'm not going to repeat that. But what I am going to focus on is one particular line that we are very interested in having to do with waterfront revitalization and also municipal parks. So uh, these two lines mostly pay for capital uh, improvements so that residents in our towns and cities uh, and villages throughout the state and also rural areas can access their waterfronts, can have nice playgrounds for their kids, can have nice playing fields for their kids as well, new hiking trails and whatnot. So uh, both of the lo those lines have been increased. Uh, in the case of uh, municipal parks, it goes to uh, 20 million. In the case of waterfront revitalization, it goes to 15 million. We also asked uh, and advocated for, and we're happy to see in the budget, that half of those funds, actually a little bit more than half, are dedicated to inner city and underserved communities. And the way that uh, Department of State and the way that the DEC administer uh, those particular programs is they look at census tract data and figure out on an economic uh, standpoint what communities are low income and they also look to see what their uh, access is to local parks uh, and recreational facilities. So uh, in the past that has meant new parks for communities in rural areas and in ur urban areas as well, not just in uh, city areas. We're very much in support of that. We hope that gets over the finish line and we're asking for your help to uh, make sure that does make it into the final enacted budget. The other major point I'll make today is about one of our top priorities uh, in both the budget and beyond, and that's the electrification of the transportation sector. And it's not just electric vehicles, it's also delivery trucks. It, uh, FedEx, for example, wants to electrify their entire fleet, which is terrific. They're testing some uh, Nissan uh, fully electric vans right now, uh, and uh, that's going to continue the rollout uh, both here in New York and elsewhere. They're going to continue that rollout, rather. In the budget, there's $9 million for charging stations, which are an initial and uh, uh, essential part of getting the transportation sector electrified. Uh, we would like to see that make it over the finish line as well. Uh, we would also call for more money for that particular program uh, if you can find it in the budget. But as uh, Commissioner Zebelman has said before, there is a chicken and the egg going on. People don't want to buy electric delivery vans. They don't want to buy uh, electric cars because they don't see the charging stations. And you as policymakers don't want to spend money on the charging stations because you don't think there's enough people driving them. But we're urging you to take the first step, uh, to take that leap, because we will be going towards a more electrified transportation system. Uh, commuters have to see, uh, excuse me, consumers have to, have to see and business owners have to see that infrastructure there in order for them to trust that they're not going to get stranded somewhere. So that's $9 million in the budget proposal. I'm going to leave my comments there, uh, and I thank you very much uh, for your time today. Thank you very much, and um, we are thrilled about the $300 million for the Environmental Protection Fund. And uh, also, I appreciate your pointing out the need for waterfront revitalization. That is a critical need, so thank you for that. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senator. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have Assemblyman Engelbright. Chris, come back. You don't have to hustle back. I just, I just want to say thank you for your advocacy, uh, for helping to point, to give us compass points to, to, to work toward um, most particularly the electrification issues. And uh, I really look forward to the possibility that we can work together to get some electrification on the north line of the Long Island Railroad this year because that is also a part 
as we had uh, a chance to discuss the other day, that's a part of this budget, in part because of the advocacy of one of your trustees, who also serves the governor. Um, thank you again. Thank, thank you, you. And so I'll, I'll add to that that um, the third track, which you're referring to on Long Island, is absolutely one of our priorities uh, for Long Island this year, and we want to see that get over the finish line as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura DeBetta, Director, Parks Program and Government Relations for Parks and Trails New York. And following her will be the New York State Conservation Council Incorporated. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. I think it still is. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today on behalf of Parks and Trails New York. I commend your endurance. Can you pull that closer to you? Sure. I'm not hearing. Yep. I was just commending you on your endurance. Uh, my name is Laura DeBetta. Uh, since 1985, Parks and Trails New York has been the leading organization working to promote, protect, and enhance a network of parks and trails across New York State. We have um, nearly 40,000 dedicated park and trail supporters that we represent. To start, I just want to thank you for your strong and steadfast support of our state park system. As you may remember, a few years ago, the New York Times called Niagara Falls shabby and underfinanced. Well, I'm happy to report that in November, the New York Times highlighted what it called the turnaround of the state park system. And that article was noticed by park leaders all across the country, including California, where they called New York's approach to tackling something seemingly so big as smart, systematic, and fearless. So I am just here today to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing and, and to keep this very exciting forward momentum going. Um, you already heard a lot this morning from Commissioner Harvey about the details of the exciting revitalization of the park system, so I would just add to that that there is broad support for continued state investment. The Governor's Parks 2020 plan is working and it's paying dividends. State parks provide a five to one return on investment and generate $2 billion in economic activity to the state, uh, providing very essential tourism dollars to communities that are located near where, where parks and historic sites are are uh, located. Um, so continued annual investments are really critical to co continuing to address the more than $1 billion backlog of health, safety, and infrastructure needs that remain unmet at parks in every region of the state. So we encourage the legislature to support the governor's proposed uh, budget of $90 million in capital funding for state parks. Now with visitation at its highest in a decade and uh, all these wonderful state-of-the-art facilities being built. There is concern about the strain that this places on the agency to keep up with visitor needs and safety and meet their expectations. Uh, and at the same time, there's also a tremendous opportunity to engage all these new visitors to our parks, especially kids who are the future stewards of uh, our, our environment and, and of our parks in the enjoyment and protection of the environment and the celebration of our path past. So in order to maximize the transformation that's happening, uh, we encourage the Senate and Assembly to work with the governor to begin to put the agency's budget on a path towards sustainability. Uh, turning to the EPF, I will echo uh, our um, strong support for the governor's proposal. We, we applaud his commitment to the EPF uh, and think that given the health of the state's economy, um, and the proven benefits of the EPF that a $300 million uh, level is appropriate and at this time. There are four categories I'd like to bring your attention to in particular. We are very pleased to see increases in three cornerstone categories of the EPF that suffered severe cuts during the financial crisis. Uh, that is state land stewardship, open space land conservation, and the municipal parks grants program. Uh, we are especially appreciative of the fourth category, which uh, is the Park and Trail Partnership Program. This was a new program last year. The governor has proposed a second year of $500,000 for this program. It's a capacity building matching grants program for the friends groups that support the state park system. Uh, and it is modeled, this program is modeled after the very successful Conservation Partnership Program, which I know many of you are familiar with. Uh, friends groups are very small, often very small, dedicated organizations who um, accomplish Herculean tasks on shoestring budgets. 
And we think this, is, this small investment will propel these organizations to a higher level of effectiveness. So we strongly support, uh, obviously, a second round of funding. We administer the program with state parks. And um, although we don't have our awardees yet, we'll announce that in March, I can tell you that demand for the program is strong. Requests uh, were more than double the amount of available funding. Um, in my written testimony, I encourage you to, of course, read it. It's beautifully written. Um, and, uh, we are it positive include, that it is. <laughs> it includes recommendations for a, a couple of items that are not in the budget. Um, these are items related to trails and bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure that we really feel should be part of the conversation about our environment, about our uh, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, and not just uh, related to transportation. So I welcome the opportunity to talk more about those as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Director DiBetta. And I want to thank you for your advocacy for our parks. We love our parks in New York, as you know. And we will be sure to read your, read your beautifully written <laughs> testimony. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charles Parker, President of the New York State Conservation Council, Incorporated. And following him will be the New York Water Environment Association. Welcome, President Parker. Thank you. Uh, the New York State Conservation Council also appreciates the uh, added funding to the EPF. My, my topics will be speaking of the Fish, Wildlife, Marine Resources, and Lands and Forests, which is currently being funded at the at a, uh, intact statement of last year, which is, which is good. Uh, most funding resources for the Fish, Wildlife, and Marine Resources are directly related to the sportsman's contribution to conservation. While there is a significant contribution through our license fee is the matching funds from the federal program, Wildlife, Fish, and Sports Recreation Program, that brings in a significant portion of available revenue for fish, wildlife, and marine resources. These funds are based on our license sales. Much of the financial and financial program commitment to the DEC has come from prior obligations that require future budgetary commitments. We welcome seeing that the continuing projects committed under New York's three and New York four for such improvements as the Young Forest Initiative, our hatchery program, DEC infrastructure and sta staffing are being funded under the proposed budget. It's nice to see that the state of New York will continue pursuing the goals of good conservation practices that the governor recognizes. As a sportsman, I hunt, fish, and trap. I, a release from Comptroller Thomas DiNapoli shows that I am not alone. Some items of note in the controller's report, fishing and hunting bring, bring a stream of cash of over $5 billion a year to the state of New York. Over 2 million people hunt, fish, and trap, ranking the state third nationwide. In several New York counties, the number of resident license holders equals more than one-third of their population. Consumer spending on these uh, sports activities brings more than $5 billion in 2011, the most recent year for which these numbers were available. One, nearly $1.9 billion, billion was spent on trip-related purchases, including transportation, lodging, and food. Non-residents generate 20% of the revenue collecting from license fees in the 2012-13 license year. In addition uh, to benefiting the economy, fish and hunting support state wildlife programs. Uh, revenues from the sale of annual licenses to fish, hunt, and trap have contributed an average of $45.3 million a year to the New York State Conservation Fund in the last five fiscal years. Spending from that fund on state wildlife conservation programs has averaged $44.3 million over the same time period. The, division, the State Division of Budget estimates $50.2 million in such expenditures in state physical year 2015 and 16. Federal programs that allocate certain funding levels, federal funding, hunting, fishing, and boating revenues to the state for the wildlife program have been provided an average of $24 million a year since 2011. Another thing that's happened recently is uh, the investment practices of the DEC Lifetime License Fund has recently changed for the good as a result of our Conservation Fund Advisory Board and the Controller's, sport, uh, controller's Office. Sportsmen would like to see this looked into further to see if we can get, either get, even get a greater return. Excuse me. Hunting and fishing is good business as well as sound conservation and environmental practices. 
Many different groups in New York State present their case of what they feel are sound environmental and conservation practices. The New York State Conservation Council agrees with some of these groups on many issues, but we have other matters on which to, we do not agree or have different perspectives. In the present uh, budget discussion and upcoming legislation, there are certain topics and pers perspectives we would like to see addressed. Uh, the management of our natural resources requires balance, taking into consideration our forests and lands, our wildlife, and man's interests. Man has a role in the balance since nature is left to its own, does not yield the best results. Management is science. The experts of the New York, in New York State are within the D Department of Environmental Conservation. There is nothing absolute and perfect. The DEC should be the primary management tool. This is not saying the DEC does not need the support of the legislative and executive levels of government. An issue in the Adir Adirondacks in practice now is that the sportsmen have a great, there is an issue in the Adirondacks that the sportsmen have a great concern. The state is gaining a considerable amount of formerly privately owned lands, but what we are not gaining is real access to these lands or sound management of the wildlife they're on. The definition of access differs depending on who you talk to. Access for a physically fit 20-year-old is not the same as some, for somebody in their 60s. We, you know, we do not see man's access as detrimental to a healthy ecosystem. Some lands being purchased uh, in the Adirondacks can be labeled as new growth. If these new growth lands are not managed for wildlife control, the roads will be lands being overbrowsed to the point where they're only the inferior plants and lo of low environmental value will exist. Mature, desired species of trees identified with a healthy forest will not grow there. This is not balanced. The state handling of the invasive species is gaining increased attention as well as should. The continued revenue support of our government along with DEC and public involvement will make for a strong coalition that positively address invasive species. Whether through budgetary or leg legislative process, the New York State Conservation Council will like to see full inclusion of the crossbow established in the archery season. Crossbows and implements that allow more people, some with lesser physical ability, to go afield hunting. Deer population, too many, too few, is becoming a concern of the sportsmen, landowners, and the public. Adequate funding is needed to study these issues. ATV, UTV weight classifications are more, have morphed into an ATV, UTV access issue. The topic needs resolution, but unfortunately it is being installed as involved parties fail to consider sound alternatives to their points of view. Snowmobile le legislation that would not require snowmobiles to pay an added fee for a trail system they do not use continues to go nowhere. We need resolution on these matters. Uh, what I've mentioned above is just part of the over 300 pieces of legislation and issues that the council deals with every year. The annual budget hearing process may appear to, to be repetitive to some. The New York State Conservation Council sees this as a process as an opportunity for like-minded stakeholders within and outside government to hear each other and work together to achieve responsible and wise use of our environmental program. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Well, certainly we appreciate having you here today, and uh, I want to thank you for the advocacy from your 300,000 sportsmen members. And uh, you may have heard earlier, I'm sure you did, that there are people, uh, legislators from Staten Island, from Long Island, who are concerned about the deer population. I don't know if we can get some of your members to go down there and take care of the problem, but it's we, a, it is a significant problem. We have willing participants. Yes, so, uh, but thank you, and it sounds like you agree with many things in the budget, which is a great step in the right direction, and we appreciate the fact that you have such a strong impact, not only on conservation in New York State, but also, as, as you pointed out, on tourism and our economic health. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much. It's not that our, far to Mexico. Our next uh, speaker is Patricia Ciro Rehill, Executive Director, Joe Brilling, Executive Director, Washington County Sewer District from the New York Water Environment Association. And following them, we will have the Adirondack Council. Thank you, Senator Young and members of the Senate and Assembly here. We appreciate the opportunity to be before you tonight regarding the significant role that public wastewater infrastructure plays in relation to protection of public health and the environment and its connection to economic development. 
My name is Patricia Ciro Rehill. I'm the executive director of the New York Water Environment Association. Our members include more than 2,500 professionals who work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, protecting public health and the environment. I have the pleasure today being here with Joe Brilling, who is a certified wastewater treatment plant operator at, and executive director of the Washington County Sewer District. We all consume water and create waste. In fact, the average American uses 176 gallons of water daily. Every drop of water that enters this building, our homes, and our businesses is treated and discharged back into the water cycle to be reused and recycled. Water is a finite resource and must be protected and managed well. We are encouraged by the governor's budget proposal to increase monies in the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015. The total investment of $300 million in grants over three years will leverage more than $1.5 billion in local investments in water infrastructure across the state. Although these increases will spur investments in clean water systems, the infrastructure needs, as you know, are much greater. We read this in the news daily. On January 13, 2016, EPA released its Clean Watershed Survey, the first national update in four years on the need for wastewater infrastructure investments, and the results are sobering. New York State has the nation's largest need for investments at $31.4 billion. The report states we need to invest in secondary wastewater treatment and new conveyance systems and their repairs and small community wastewater treatment plants, and we need to reduce combined sewer overflows and pollution from stormwater. Again, New York has the largest need for investments across the nation. The first round of New York State water grants established by the governor and legislature as part of the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015 has been an unprecedented success, and we are very grateful. $50 million in grant funding was awarded to 45 projects across the state, leveraging more than $440 million in infrastructure improvements. The present Clean Water State Revolving Fund Intended Use Plan has $10.1 billion in listed projects, with only estimated funds available of $1.27 billion. It must be clearly understood that the $10.1 billion is only for those projects where a municipality submitted an application through the EFC process. Although dated, according to a 2008 analysis by New York State DEC, 30% of wastewater collection systems in the state are beyond their expected useful life. And the investment needed to maintain current service levels over the next 20 years, 36.2 billion. This year, I'm very proud of a broad coalition of organizations representing environmental, municipal utility, business, and recreational interests, many who have been before me and who are following after us, have requested $800 million in funding for water infrastructure to build on the success of the New York State water grants established by the Water Infrastructure Improvement Act of 2015. There are over 600 wastewater utilities in New York State servicing more than 15 million people. Each plant has a permit with a responsibility of a certified chief operator to make sure the plant is in compliance. There are over 2,600 operators in New York State. These clean water utilities provide a critical, often overlooked service to our residents, businesses, and visitors. For those of you who have visited your local wastewater utility, I'm sure you all have, you understand this is your community's largest capital investment, and these plants are complex utilities that include mechanical, chemical, and biological processes. Depending on the size of the plant and the community it serves, a wastewater operations specialist today has a wide range of expertise to perform their everyday job. In fact, we call them our silent heroes. According to the U.S. Treasury, infrastructure investments create good paying construction and manufacturing jobs and are overwhelmingly supported by the public. It is estimated that $1 billion in investment in water and wastewater infrastructure can create 26,000 jobs. The complexity of wastewater infrastructure improvements requires the combined efforts 
of planners, engineers, equipment manufacturers, distributors, contractors, and operators throughout the supply chain. 70% of the nation's engineering firms and 90% of general and heavy construction firms are small businesses. And as we know, small business is the backbone of our, of our American economy. Some relevant history here. In the mid-60s, Governor Rockefeller decided to develop a program to clean up the polluted waters of the state. He titled it the Pure Waters Program, and the construction grants program followed. The people of the state of New York in the 60s approved a $1 billion bond issue in favor of clean water. One of the important elements of that program was massive construction grants to municipalities. It was a program that became a precursor to the Federal Clean Water Act and served as a national model. New York can be in the lead again. It is time for a new New York State Pure Waters program, and the New York Water Environment Association did develop a white paper on this. Abundant clean water is essential to public health, environmental quality, and our economy. Too often we take for granted these resources and the invisible systems that bring it to us. We cannot afford to ignore these challenges and need to work together to make the health and safety of our water a priority. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you um, I think Senator Kruger had a comment or question. Thank you. Um, so it was many, many hours ago that we were speaking with the acting commissioner of DEC, Basil Sagos. And a number of us brought up the question of given what's recently happened in Hoosick Falls, the national, if not international, tension to the Flint, Michigan crisis, what more do we need to do to try to, A, avoid these problems before they happen? And should we be doing something more than we are now to allow um, our citizens to be able to review and check the water in, that's coming out of their taps? Thank you for the question. I'll start and then I'll transfer it to okay, Joe. Okay, thank you. So I think public education is critically important. Uh, um, water is undervalued and people generally don't even know what they pay for their water and sewer bills. So we have to have a great public education campaign. And as stated, I think we need to bring more money into the system so we can make sure we've got viable systems out there. Joe, anything to add? The only thing I would, I would reinforce that Continuing this trend of, of investing um, in, the, in the infrastructure, not just the infrastructure, but the industry itself, uh, the employees, the operators, the municipal people that are, that are in the trenches, for lack of a better word, on, on a day-to-day, night-to-night <coughs> basis, um, is really important, along with the public education. Um, it is true that most people don't even realize <laughs> what they're paying for water or sewer. Um, they just pay the bill. And, and if rates go up by 5%, people panic. Um, yet, you know, we all have internet, we all have, uh, you know, think nothing of going out and spending $2 for a bottle of water. Um, so that's where the public education piece comes in. And, and I think it's huge. This trend that we are seeing now with the governor's budgets of the past couple of years is is the right way to go. Um, it may fall short, but it's a great first few steps. Thank you for that. Thank you. Senator? Uh, your testimony is very cogent and, and, and very uh, important, so thank you for taking the time to organize your thoughts like this. I was intrigued. You said uh, close to the end of your presentation that you had a white paper that had been prepared. Thank you. Uh, could you share that with uh, I would be happy to. myself and, and my colleague, Mr. O'Mara? Uh, yes. Senator O'Mara is uh, also a, a partner in, in this uh, process. And uh, we worked together last year to help uh, keep uh, the trend line going for additional investment, which you do see this year. Um, the key for arriving at a place where we really are able to deal with a $36 billion uh, nut is uh, to have some federal partners. How are we doing in that regard? Are you talking to anybody? We are. Are they listening? I hope so. We have people going down actually in two weeks, so um, 
We are on that, and actually I'm happy to report that we're working with our advocacy organizations um, on that campaign, because um, with one voice we are amplified.